in about 1931, I was so severe that my parents took me to see her, Mrs. Mabel Gifford. And she had a private practice as well as being head of the speech for that state. She herself was very poised and I can remember sitting there and she told me a story of Aesop's fables about grapes and I had to repeat it back. I don't remember, but I must have stuttered a lot then. Because when I was young, there was a silent movie made of me and it shows me showing a squirrel going up a tree and you just know that I'm going to use the word squirrel because you see him running up the branches of the tree and I'm explaining to someone and there it's just the squirrel, the terrible tonic blocks, the hard stoppages, terribly severe. Around that time, now whether it preceded the Gifford thing or not, that my father, who was Stanford 1912, got on the phone and rang up Professor Lewis Terman, who's a famous psychologist who did the IQ exams and all that years ago, to explain that he had this son who stuttered badly and what to do about it. And we had somebody sent to the house who was up for her master's in psychology under Terman at Stanford. She came to do play therapy with me. Now, Helen, I just loved her, and she said, to be fair about it, she said years later that I would speak fluently with her, but she said my home environment was such that it was not conducive to good speech. Now, whether I might have cleared the deck had I had other things happening, I don't know, and we'll never know, we'll never know, because I know of all too many now who have had ex experienced this and have got fluent speech by whatever means, by nature mainly, and then have had relapses even at 40 years old or 50. So in my thinking, I think if there's been any of this that's been recorded in the brain, it is there subject to recall under certain conditions later in life. That's how organic I am in my thinking. But I never began to really get better until I accepted the organicity thing. And then it began to loosen me up inside because I felt part of this I can't really help. And no one has ever been able to define what this thing is. They thought it was a momentary lack of a synapse or whatever it is. A stutterer dreads, and I think this is for other people too, adults, having to say a certain specific thing forced to say it at a certain time. That is why you stutter so much on your name because uh, almost invariably there'll be somebody sticking out their hand, I'm Bob so-and-so, and you have to come back and say your name in that split second that he allows you to. There's no time for fumbling on your own name. You're a mental case if you don't know your name. All this comes together and just absolutely blows you up. If I had had therapy at the time that would have been more opening up and allowing the reality of what stuttering is and learning not to try to suppress it so hard and to fight it so hard, I would have missed out on the tremendous amount of relapse that I had later on. I had no help in high school at all. And high school was a murderous thing. Reciting on the telephone was just all but impossible. I remember blocking for 30 seconds of contortions on the phone. I'd like to start probably with uh, Charles Van Riper because uh, he said really that it boils down to an interruption of the forward flow of speech and that if this occurs often enough that it will produce uh, a negative reaction from society and that it will perhaps make the person maladjusted. Uh, so that is probably the simplest way to put it, I would say. It is a stoppage in the forward flow of speech. And I think above all, it's important to say that it's involuntary because the research has been showing that it is impossible really to duplicate a true 
stuttering interruption. Dr. West, Dr. Robert West said that to him it was a matter of uh, some type of a weakness that affected the speech mechanism and that the disorder was perpetuated by a continuation, continuation of that weakness or by a morbid awareness of the difficulty. And, but Dr. West went on to say that it's very likely a combination of both of those factors that makes it into the problem. And uh, of course, I myself have always leaned toward an organic thinking or theory for the basis of the difficulty. I've always been of that mind. Uh, there is no set therapy that fits one individual exactly. You've got to know the person. You cannot separate the disorder from the person himself or herself. You cannot do it. It is impossible because this thing as Wendell Johnson had written in his marvelous book, Because I Stutter from 1930, which I have read very many times over. And I think it's the best book to explain what it's like to be at the bottom of the valley. Uh, he said, it's like a vine that gets all tangled up in the branches of a tree. Stuttering is like that. Bring Bringelson. I got to know him, and I think his thinking is very, very neurological, of course. And uh, he speaks about the fact that he was one of the first to use what we call voluntary stuttering. And this was an offshoot from Knight Dunlop, who in the 1920s had found that if you make a mistake and you do it on purpose, then you are much less likely to make that mistake in the future. Bringelson was the first one to say to me, you should go on and get a PhD. And uh, if it hadn't been for Bring, I feel that uh, I might never have begun the doctorate. I might never have gone into the university level. I wanted to go into the field and I sort of made a deal with myself that my speech had to improve to a level where I'd get by. But it was on thin ice for a long time because in those days, I think it was much, much harder to get accepted in the profession. Nowadays, I notice a shift. And why do we have this shift? I think in part because ASHA is realizing more and more how deep stuttering is.